Allora, benvenuti, eh, benvenuti a tutti anche a, questa, a questo incontro che eh, continua diciamo, il nostro percorso di celebrazione dei 20 anni del Punto Europa e quindi vi ringrazio per, essere, per continuare a partecipare eh, numerosi. Eh, questa lezione in particolare, questo incontro in particolare riguarderà eh, Terrorism and European Security e sarà tenuto dalla uh, dottoressa, professoressa Silvia D'Amato e introdotto da Sonia Lucarelli, poi loro parleranno tranquillamente in inglese per eh, gli stranieri in inglese che ci sono qua. E, e vi ricordo appunto che questo incontro rientra all'interno delle celebrazioni dei 20 anni del Punto Roma che è un centro di informazione sull'Unione Europea che è presente qui all'interno del TC Hub nel blocco D eh, che fa parte del Network Europe Direct in quanto centro di documentazione europea ed è un centro di eccellenza già Muni per gli studi europei quindi un eh, supporto per qualsiasi vostro dubbio, domanda, questione relativo all'Unione Europea, saremo, noi siamo lì e saremo ben lieti di eh, darvi una mano. Eh, vi ricordo di prendere questo volantino, anche se eh, credo che ormai sia piuttosto diffuso, eh, ricordandovi appunto che da qui a giugno ci saranno tutta una serie di eh, appuntamenti che non vi ricordo tutti in questo momento, vi do semplicemente più che altro appuntamento a giovedì, ora, l'11 aprile, in aula 12, per un incontro sulla politica di immigrazione dell'Unione Europea con le parlamentari europee Elish Schlein e Cecil Kienz e vi do soprattutto appuntamento poi al 9 maggio, in cui, eh, che sarà un po' l'apice delle nostre celebrazioni dei nostri 20 anni con la festa dell'Europa. Adesso passo la parola a Sonia per invece tutto l'incontro. So um, I'm just introducing the speaker today because I don't want to take any time from uh, her own uh, speech. I'm really very happy to introduce uh, Silvia D'Amato. Dr. D'Amato is uh, a fellow, uh, Max Weber fellow at the European University Institute in Florence. She works uh, on uh, uh, strategic cultures, counterterrorism, and it's on this topic that she has just published a book, which is the uh, offspring of her PhD, Cultures of Counterterrorism, French and Italian Responses to Terrorism After 9-11. That's the book, just out. And uh, the, the book is based on her PhD that uh, she wrote uh, at the Scuola Normale in Florence. I'm happy to say I was her supervisor, and I'm even more happy to say that she studied here. So that's a good hope for you, who will do a, an academic career inspired by Silvia. I leave her the floor. Uh, terrorism and European security is a topic. Thank you so much. So probably stand up so you can all see me. Uh, thank you very much uh, to Punto Europa, first of all, uh, for inviting me and uh, Professor Giuliana Raschi in particular, uh, but also thank you to the, the organization, to Fabio and Cristina for helping me a lot with all the organizational stuff I'm not super good at. Uh, Sonia, now it's the time that I can finally humiliate you publicly and thanking you for all the support and help in all these years, so really thank you so much. I really think that this has been possible thanks to her, so thank you. <laughs> um, so welcome everyone and thank you for being here. Uh, I imagine you're all tired uh, since it's already uh, 15 uh, past 6, so I hope you will uh, stay with me a little bit. Um, I will try to find, to find the um, way to catch your attention. Uh, although. Uh, Uh, unfortunately, terrorism is today a very popular topic for the wrong reasons. Um, and we tend to think that uh, in the last few, let's say, probably one, two years, the emergence somehow has uh, gone, uh, meaning that terrorism doesn't cover the headlines as we used to, as you know, in the, let's say, the couple of years after uh, 2015. But it might be problematic to say that we won the war on terror, and it might be um, 
problematic to say that the uh, threat doesn't exist anymore or has significantly decreased. Um, as we tend to um, talk about and consider terrorism only or mostly when there are uh, physical violent attacks, um, although we should take into consideration also those attacks that didn't happen and the organization behind these violent uh, manifestation of, uh, of terrorism. Um, so today with you I would like to cover two specific points. Uh, since the uh, talk is called Terrorism and European Security, I would like first to spend a few words on who are they, trying to see if there is a, a European terrorism, let's say, uh, a form of terrorism that it's um, specific, characteristical of the European, um, within, let's say, the European territory or across European states. Uh, and also trying to uh, focus on our responses. So what are the main characteristics, uh, characteristics of the uh, European responses? While uh, doing that, I would like to focus the attention on, uh, let's say across these two uh, points, to focus the attention on uh, two additional points. So the relation with terror of terrorism with other social political phenomena, uh, conflict specifically, but also migration. And also, I would like you to uh, pay attention in the references that I will probably make across the talk, during the talk uh, about the specific internal and external dynamics that seems to characterize um, European terrorism today, let's say. Um, so, is there a specific category of European terrorism? I'm usually very careful, for those of you who already know me, probably from past uh, lectures, very careful in defining terrorism, in the sense that the definition of terrorism might more depend on the um, a power relationship that exists between the defining agent, so usually states and governments, and the actors. Um, but I would like to see if there are some common characteristics that we can uh, think about to, uh, to try to define uh, these, uh, this threat. Um, this is just to give you an overview, I imagine from the back you cannot see, but I will talk you over the, uh, the figure. So here you have the victims of terrorism attacks in Western Europe from 1970 to 2015. And you have a bunch of European countries here. In blue you have United Kingdom, Spain in yellow, Italy in green, France uh, red, Germany uh, blue and others in grey. So as you can see, these are all the 70s, 80s, 90s, and 2000s. As you can see, and these are the victims, all right? So the casualties caused by uh, terrorist attacks. So contrary to what we usually think, terrorism was far more lethal in the past, especially in Europe. And let's say in the, after 2001, there has not been much uh, uh, casualties, of course, despite, um, uh, with the exception of Madrid attacks, the London attacks, and the uh, 2011 uh, attacks in Norway, and from, of course, uh, 2015. And these are more, it's a more recent story that I imagine you all are more um, uh, familiar with. So as you can see, let's say, what we think about terrorism today, might be, let's say, contextualized or also um, uh, understood in comparative terms to terrorism yesterday. And it's not that um, the threat didn't exist before, uh, but it was actually even uh, stronger and definitely more lethal that we, um, uh, that we see today. Um, and that despite the complexity of uh, terrorism and that any definition linked to terrorism, um, what what this let's say what defines terrorism is usually an organization. So the fact that terrorism is a collective type of violence, and we will see different declinations of it over the talk, but it's an organization 
it's an organized type of political violence. And here you, oh, sorry. so here you have some data on uh, the, uh, um, let's say, comparing the actually launched pl plots and the foil plots, so those that failed. So I don't know if you can see here, but in red you have the plots that have been launched, and in gray, light gray here, you have all those plots that have been, um, let's say, uh, prevented by uh, European law enforcement agency, agencies, which of course tells us that there is much more going on in terms of organization than the actual final outcome, violent outcome. Um, so who are they, right? Uh, who are these people that we uh, define terrorists? Usually, uh, when you talk about terrorism today, this is the typical interpretation we have. So, uh, specifically about European terrorists, European jihadists. Um, usually, the, the, let's say this picture somehow summarizes the representation and the imaginary around the uh, typical European jihadist meaning a uh, um, young, mostly male, uh, European citizens, definitely with beard, uh, not to be mistaken with hipster um, all across European cities, uh, but, you know, uh, converted to Islam and to a radical interpretation of Islam. Um, however, what we are seeing today is that more and more attacks are conducted also by different type of people with different stylistic choices, so no beard, <laughs> no long hair. Um, but it's a type of violence that seems to be comparable, despite the fact that we differentiate it within, between, let's say, jihadist violence and right-wing violence. So we tend to focus on the political here, while here we focus on the religious, right? However, um, what these groups seems to have, and these people seems to have in common, and the, let's say the use of violence for these people, is it's very careful to, um, to know that the, out, the violent outcome is not the uh, goal end, uh, meaning that the outcome is just a um, strategy, unfortunately. Violence per se is not the, what they're actually looking for, but there is something else, there is organization, right? Um, and I quote Jenkins here, saying that uh, the effect of terrorism are intended to be psychological. Terror causes people to exaggerate the strength of terrorists and the threats they pose. And these, let's say, um, strategies seems to be what it um, makes these two different groups very similar at the end of the day. So the fact that terrorists use killings, mostly civilians, is unfortunately a very well-planned strategy most of the time. Uh, which um, somehow impacts on the way we discuss about terrorism, of course, and then the way we respond to it. Um, this is because law and mo usually um, numerically insignificant uh, level of violence might actually multiplicate the public effect. So the first thing these groups, all these groups, seem to care about is publicity. So terrorism has a larger effect than the specific uh, act of violence. It is a strategy usually uh, uh, practitioners call it the strategy of the weak, against, uh, the weak against the strong. So in order to uh, enhance the, uh, and to reduce the capability gap between a non-state actor and a non-state organization and uh, states, very powerful states, you use terrorism. And the first way to go to reduce this gap in power is publicity. Why do you think publicity is the key to reduce this gap in power? 
What does this kind of publicity generate? Anyone? Yes, fear. So fear is the channel through which you increase your uh, publicity and you increase your power, okay? So it's, it might be hard to think about terrorism like this as a cold strategy, um, but um, let's say that the, the goal is really to um, it's a kind of a means of propaganda. It's more, mostly uh, it's a communication strategy rather than a warfare one, or rather than only a warfare one. So the immediate victim is merely instrumental. So the target is not that specific civilian that you want to target most of the time. It's not that specific bus or that specific mall that you want to target. Your real target is someone else. And the effect that you want to create is much larger than that specific act of violence. Um, and unfortunately, terrorists are quite sophisticated in anticipating the responses we give to such a horrific type of violence. Um, and there are clear consequences for, uh, for this, and they're very good at using fear, and these are just few data on I don't know if you can read this, but uh, in uh, orange slash red, you have um, percentages of responses agreeing with the fact that refugees will increase the likelihood of terrorism. And you see Hungary in first, uh, first position, Poland, Germany, Netherlands, Italy, Sweden, Greece, United Kingdom, France, and Spain. Spain only 40%, which I think makes sense considering the history of terrorism they had and the relationship that it's pretty open talked about between Spain international uh, interventionism and domestic attacks. And here in blue you have, of course, uh, the opposite. So refugees will not increase the likelihood of terrorism. And as you can see, the uh, distribution is quite uh, significant. So there is a popular and dominant interpretation association between uh, terrorism and migration on the basis of the geographical origin of these people. So they're coming from Syria, they're definitely uh, terrorists. Or they're coming from uh, North Africa, so they're terrorists. Or alleged religious belief. So if they're Muslim, of course they're terrorists. Somehow they will have some extreme ideas and somehow they will hate the West and our liberal uh, democratic values. So on the basis of this, I'm simplifying, of course. But let's say the dominant popular discourse somehow highlights this uh, connection, uh, these links between uh, terrorists um, and um, migrants. But who are they then? Uh, let's try to, if we said that uh, the organized people, who are they? Is there a way to identify them? Definitely the Brussels uh, attacks more than the Paris once somehow unveiled the European plot, let's say the European network. Uh, so um, law enforcement uh, agencies discovered that dozens of people were connected to the, to the attacks, even beyond those that were actually implementing those, uh, those attacks. Um, and um, um, somehow you might remember this, the uh, term of the lone wolf started to be very popular associated also with um, foreign fighters, right? Here you have a picture of uh, Abdelim uh, Abadou, who is, uh, I don't want to say allegedly because there are pretty strong evidence against him, but he is the guy who is uh, um, considered to be, let's say, the engineering of the uh, Paris attack and also the consular for the Brussels ones. But he's just, let's say, the peak of the iceberg, right? So it's a, a network of connections, a transnational actor of connections uh, that link far, far away conflict, so let's say Syria and Iraq, and uh, European security. Um, and talking about, uh, he's just an example of the mentioned 
uh, lone wolf slash foreign fighters versus um, slash ISIS. So we tend to to consider all these three, then let's say, uh, actors <laughs> the same. And you might actually have some overlappings, but usually they are very different people. And they're very, they have very different intents and aspirations, and very different reasons to use violence, despite the fact that, again, we think they're uh, all the same. Um, lone wolf, for instance, um, as, to, as terrorism per se, uh, the strategy, the lone wolf strategy is actually uh, a very um, old strategy, mostly used in the 19th century by anarchists, um, so the leaderless resistance. So lone wolf, sorry I forgot to mention that wolf, lone wolf more, uh, specifically refers to um, those, uh, let's say the actions of those individuals who are not directly linked to a terrorist organization, but they implement those acts and the acts and the, uh, uh, the use of violence of these individuals is in any way connected to that organization in, let's say, for other reasons. So it might be the case that the terrorist organization per se that didn't plan that specific attack, in the end decided to claim responsibility for it. Or try to inspire uh, these other attacks so without giving direct incentives and direct instructions, but trying to develop inspiration, okay? To develop the so-called copycat effect. And I was saying that the uh, anarchists are actually the first who uh, tried to use this strategy, so inspire other individuals that are not directly connected to them to do the same. Um, but it has also used very much during the Cold War by uh, anti-Soviet America, and especially in Eastern Europe. And there has been a lot of research done also on the Ku Klux Klan and the uh, lone wolf strategy used by the Ku Klux Klan, not only about, uh, against black people, but also against uh, government representatives. Um, and they, as, I, as I was saying, they act for very different reasons. They act for very different motivations, although we tend to uh, focus only on the religious one. Um, ISIS, differently from Al-Qaeda, they didn't want really to use this type of strategy as they thought that um, organization members really had to pass through a certain process of formation. ISIS instead relied very much on uh, the lone wolf strategy, so tried to inspire people, especially across Europe, to do the same without giving direct incentives, also giving direct instructions through the internet, but mostly to inspire ideologically other people. Mostly because it's cheap and it's relatively easy. For your organization, it's not really expensive to incentivize this kind of behavior. And for the person itself, again, it's not super easy. Basically, you need a car or even a knife and you're done. You have your terrorist attack. It's very useful to avoid prevention because usually uh, people that are committing these uh, attacks uh, pass very much under the radar of the authorities, so there are unsuspected uh, people. And you might basically uh, very easily uh, uh, avoiding all the prevention instruments and measures that have been implemented. It's a powerful instrument to raise emotional reactions, so you polarize very much the society with a very simple attack. You might strongly polarize the society. Um, and you might also increase the, the, pop, let's say the, the popular demand by European citizens uh, on their government to act and to respond to these attacks. So stabilizing and, let's say, challenging the political stability of many governments, not to mention the party uh, politics here, it's an increasingly useful local and international image booster. So not only you can show to your faraway enemy, 
let's say, ISIS versus the, the US or France, that you're stronger than you actually are on the ground. But also locally, you can attract a lot of people, but well, also internationally. But basically, this, it's an image booster for both your enemy and potential sympathizer. Because if you're that cool to implement uh, attacks all over the world, maybe a lot of people would like to be part of the organization and do the same. And this is linked, of course, to the uh, force multiplier. So it's not only a um, discourse force, but also a material force on the ground. Because your uh, my um, push Western countries and states to react in inconsistent ways and somehow uh, challenging also their military superiority by putting pressure on them. And you can do this physically, again, as a hit and run strategy. But you can do this also online, right? So transnationalism here, it's not only material, but it's also, let's say, I hate this word, but let's say ideological. And you might be, uh, you might cause offline behavior on the basis of your online communication and facilitate the external internal relationships. So having the external closer to the internal and causing in the internal more troubles that you actually have on the ground in the external dimension. And when you talk about, um, let's say, long wolf specifically, so the question of how and why these European citizens uh, or residents, so maybe without the European nationality, but raised, born and raised in European countries, it's very hard to understand why people that are not directly socialized to violence, um, let's say used to free and democratic uh, social rules, why would they embrace violence? It's very hard for um, policymakers, for of course for the public, but also for researchers to try to find the uh, rational motive or let's say the concrete reasons of why someone that's not socialized to violence and used to a di different kind of political interaction, why would they use violence in order to achieve their goal? Um, and of course, as you might imagine, the French school was the leading one in the so-called debate on radicalization. Um, and there is a very famous querelle between Gilles Kepel, who is professor at Sciences Po Paris, and uh, Olivier Roy, who is professor at the European University Institute. And they basically start from opposing uh, uh, perspective. So Gilles Kepel talks about radicalization of Islam. So somehow uh, builds on the, let's say, more general popular uh, dominant interpretation that we have and we hear about, uh, not only in the newspaper, but let's say in the general, um, among the general public. So violence happens because radicalized individuals um, legitimize, uh, their vi basically, sorry, uh, they, they become radicalized and they accept the fact that violence is a natural way to go to realize this radical belief. So in a way, it's all the fault of Islam. <laughs> I'm exaggerating, of course, is more sophisticated than this. But basically, he finds specific features of Islam as a religion and as an ideological framework to explain violence. Olivier Roy instead says, it's not that these people um, are radicalized uh, to um, Islam and therefore to violence, but it's an Islamization of radicalization. So it's the opposite dynamic. Meaning that these young people are already somehow attracted to violence and already have some desires of, some desire of um, action in, in a weird way. 
but they're already attracted to violence, so they already want to put in place some violent behavior. And what they do, I'm sorry, uh, what they do is basically they use Islamist claims and religious uh, belief to justify their desire for violence. So they use, they pick up what they need from the religious belief and they use it to justify for themselves and for the public the use of violence. It's not that I have a clear answer here, so don't expect me to. I'm just giving you what the experts say and the debate that it's uh, here on the, uh, let's say, uh, under the attention of scholars interested in that, also because I don't specifically work on radicalization. But it's interesting to notice that there are very different opinions on the way people radicalize. And again, I was mentioning, lone wolf is something, so European uh, groups that decided to implement uh, terrorist attack in Europe is something. The so-called foreign fighters is another category, if you want. And even here, there are doubts, there are problems in identifying a clear profile. Because researchers uh, tell us um, there are very different reasons and there are very diff different psychological profiles and psychological um, uh, mechanisms behind uh, these uh, actions. I find it interesting to give you some insight by, uh, uh, from the book of Phil Gursky, uh, who is a um, practitioner. He was a Canadian um, uh, Secret Service agent, agent, and he has been doing a lot of research lately to um, understand the motivation of the so-called Western foreign fighters. And he actually found out that the, the reasons for the let's say the, mm, yeah, the main reasons that he collected by interviewing all these people and to gathering data from the arrests and, pro and trials were actually very similar to the reasons of why normal people join the army, so Western uh, regular army. Uh, specifically, however, he uh, finds that uh, there are different factors. One, the first one is purpose. So the idea that all these people actually wanted to do something. Many of them, <laughs> weirdly enough, uh, many of them talk about responsibility to protect. So the idea of doing something good, although for us good might, be some, might mean something different, in their interpretation they were actually doing something good. So they actually wanted to realize something good and to go abroad and fight in order to accomplish that. There is definitely a supranational religious solidarity, meaning that I'm going, I'm traveling, I'm going and join the uh, rebellion uh, in order to um, protect and to help the Sunni people that are repressed by not only Western governments, but also from local governments. Um, so there is definitely an element of uh, solidarity here. At the more micro level, there is what they call a group processes of comradeship, meaning that um, many of these young people were motivated by uh, the desire of being, of belonging to a group. So violence is a, one of, probably one of the strongest, uh, ident let's say, uh, mean to achieve closeness in a group and to achieve solidarity and sense of uh, belonging. And of course there are some, also some elements of people actually interested in violence uh, and action. So to basically, to put it simply, to be bored of the Western uh, easy life and to go and do something in a more uh, active way. Um, and the way, let's say, Western countries and Europeans specifically have responded to, uh, to these rat to foreign fighters and to their challenge is of course different, although there are some commonalities. Uh, but they tend to focus on different elements. And this is where, uh, let's say, I open my uh, part of the speech dedicated to the response. 
So you see here France, Germany, the Netherlands, and the EU and the UK. They all have a criminalizing approach and prosecution that is now um, much, uh, much more based on the so-called e-evidence. So there are um, prosecutors that spend hours uh, to find videos online that can, can actually incriminate the person that they want to charge and put on trial. So this is called e-evidence. So online evidence of the violent and terrorist behavior of this person. Imprisonment, of course. Some of them going also for revocation and uh, citizenship and passport. So Germany specifically and United Kingdom. But you also have more alternative hippies way of interpreting violence. So you have more uh, programs that are um, basically the uh, the idea is to rehabilitate these people and to uh, give them the possibility to re-enter the society and somehow uh, challenging their opposition in a different way of contestation, if you want. Um, the question on how to respond to foreign fighters seems to be more and more relevant today. Yeah, I don't know if you have uh, seen this, but a few weeks ago, no, it was February, Trump publicly said, to Europeans and to the European Union to uh, you know, take responsibilities for the European fighters that have been cut on the ground in, uh, um, in Syria. So why they are basically saying that they don't want to take care of them anymore, so it's the responsibility of European states and the EU to elaborate a strategy to, to do what, what do you want to do? Do you want to have them back in Europe? I mean, you have to, guys, to... Uh, take your own responsibility and decide what is the future of these of these people. Um, and here lies uh, very much my um, concern, very much my attention uh, between the internal and, and external. Um, in the sense that what seems to be clear is that there is a direct connection between what we do outside and what we do inside as it is the same for terrorist organization. They are not only operating abroad, and they are not only operating internally. So every domestic attack has still an international echo. And the same seems to be true for us, in the sense that we cannot separate anymore that clearly the internal security and the external interventionism or external uh, protection, if you want. Um, and again, the Brussels attacks were those attacks that clearly revealed uh, that there was a problem of communication at the internal level, meaning that states that were supposed to put all the fancy data and information on the shared uh, data sets uh, didn't do that. For instance, Belgium didn't um, share the information on, um, I don't remember his name, on the guy that was basically responsible for the Brussels attack, despite the fact that he already had a criminal record and he was arrested a few months before in the, uh, by Turkey in the Syrian uh, border. So the Belgians already knew that he was somehow uh, a potential terrorist, but they didn't share the information, the intel with the fellow Europeans. And this one is one, uh, one of the main problems. Um, and the thing is that the you know, European Union had, uh, didn't really develop a new strategy. Uh, as you probably know, from, for terrorism specifically. So as you probably know, in 2005, uh, let's say the uh, latest uh, strategy for counterterrorism is dated 2005. And since then, there have been some updates, some, um, some let's say, some directions, some guidelines, but there is not a, a real strategy on counterterrorism hasn't been uh, developed, um, really. And according to some of the interviews that I've conducted, it seems not to be the case in the near future, so there is no clear interest in developing a new one. So let's say uh, the four pillars are still the same. So prevent, protect, pursue, and respond. I will not go into the details, but I'd be happy to do this in the Q&A, as for time reasons, 
focus, uh, on, let's say, on the actors responsible for this response. So at the internal level, let's say the uh, big guy is Oliver Onidi, who is Deputy Director for General, uh, General for Security, so DG Migration and Home Affairs. At the external level, you have Pedro Serrano, who is the uh, Deputy Secretary General for CSTP mission. And in the coordination, there is this guy that I don't particularly like, but um, Gilles de Kerkov, who is the uh, EU co uh, counterterrorist coordinator since 2005. Um, sorry. And this guy is Julian King, who is the new commissioner for the so-called Security Europe. So again, at the internal level. So there is, at least at the institutional level, the desire to develop um, expertise, specific expertise that might connect the external with the internal. All white, old men, probably heterosexual, so if you might <laughs> accept a feminist comment here, it doesn't seem to be much of diversity uh, in the background. Um, and these are, let's say, the actors at the individual level. Of course, Europol is the, uh, one of the key actors in the fight against terrorists today, although, interesting enough, terrorism was not absolutely not mentioned. Uh, at the, let's say they didn't really want to have terrorism as an uh, expertise when Europol was created. And it was only because of Spain that terrorism was included as um, a potential field of operation of Europol because of, of course, the uh, uh, domestic problem Spain had as many other European states uh, with terrorism. So Europol, as you know, is the role intelligence gatherer. They work mostly on the counter terrorism units and the counter task force, but with the wave of new attacks, they decided to uh, create these new units, the European counter terrorist centers, uh, the modern others um, also work with research. Here, for those of you who are interested, uh, there is a link for the publications uh, for the annual, let's say, for the connection of the annual terrorist situation and trend report that Europol issues every year. So, if you have to do a little research, here there are some uh, interesting data. Although. Uh, think about this data in a critical way if you want, because they simplify a lot. So just a warning. What it's interesting to notice is that even at the supranational level, so European Union, there has been an increased incentive to go be or minilateral, meaning that the EU has somehow accepted and emphasized the need for bilateral or minilateral uh, initiatives from member states. A very famous one and very successful one, ex se, it's the Task Force Fraternité. I imagine you cannot see this. But it's the cooperation, specific cooperation launched by the French and the Belgian government uh, in response to terrorism. So it's not only data collections, but also uh, kind of um, implementing procedural, uh, shared procedures. So having the same protocols while, I don't know, arresting that guy. So putting, let's say, the uh, emphasis on the need to share procedures or rather than or only, let's say, information. Um, of course, I'm super late already. <laughs> um, other, I won't say central actor, but let's say another actor, is the EU Intelligence Analysis Center. Uh, they basically don't do anything if not with assessments and intelligence summaries and reports. So they don't have the, they're not an operational agency, so they cannot actually go and arrest someone, and they cannot even uh, collect data on their own, but what they do is that they collect the data that states a share, that states want to give, and they create some fancy reports and uh, uh, some strategic analysis on what we can do on the basis of what the states uh, told us. 
the external level, um, let's say the EU has mostly gone uh, through bilateral agreements um, and with uh, CSDP missions. Uh, however, what it seems to be, I'm working now at the moment with my research at the UI in the interaction between European external interventionism and European member states, uh, sorry, European states. So the interaction between the supranational EU level and the member states activities, so I'll give you some, some detail about this. But it's interesting to notice that there is a stronger, stronger interconnection between even unilateral or bilateral operations by European states, not necessarily member states, and EU institutions. And this convergence, however, uh, is also characterized by some pretty interesting competing dynamics. And I will give you some, uh, some examples of this. Um, this is just, uh, here I'm specifically focusing on um, European states, uh, of course apart from the US. So you have US-led coalition against uh, Iraq and Syria. Um, UK here, France, Netherlands, uh, Denmark and Belgium. So all these countries actually implemented our strikes. Uh, so actually bombing these countries, all of them in Iraq, why UK, France, Netherlands, uh, also in Syria. And what is usually people never talk about, but the bombing and the arc strikes, I'm sorry the slide is not perfect here, uh, but the, uh, this military operation actually uh, was started before all the, uh, let's say, the famous new wave of attacks in uh, 2015. It actually started in August 2014. So when the terrorists were saying, and I'm not justifying them, of course, but when they were saying we are doing this for Syria, is because France was already bombing Syria for one hour or so, uh, one year or so. So there is a connection between internal domestic security and external projection of military power. So it might be the case that in external military inventions, interventions actually, actually increase the likelihood of domestic terrorist attacks. Here, just, uh, uh, just an overview of the differences between the uh, European countries, let's uh, um, say, measures in counterterrorism in different theaters. So I think here considers both Syria and Iraq and the MENA region. So again, you see different uh, countries that are uh, operating in different ways. Not everyone is using our strikes or drones. Definitely everyone has direct supports. Uh, and training, which is, let's say, the training is the, one of the typical uh, pro EU approach to uh, CSDP mission. One. Uh, weapons provisions, almost everyone except the Netherlands, Poland, and Belgium. Uh, and many of them are also, uh, let's say, uh, present in this many of the same um, theaters with peacekeeping, with uh, peacekeeping operations that are somehow overlapping many of these operations. So there is a, an overlap, okay? So European countries are operating in different, with different modalities. Not only EU, not only United Nations, not only bilaterally or unilaterally. And it's interesting to see what happens when you have all this level of governance operating at the external level uh, for the same purpose, counterterrorism. Here uh, you have a um, picture of Sahel, the Sahel region, which is the regions I'm focusing now uh, at the moment for my research. Um, a region that, as you probably know, is characterized by a very serious terrorist threat, so different terrorist organizations, not only affiliated with the famous one, so Al-Qaeda and ISIS, or now the very famous Boko Haram in green here. Uh, but there are different militias that actually use terrorist techniques. Uh, complicated by the question of irregular um, 
smuggling of uh, human beings and irregular migrations coming mostly from this area here, uh, let's say the so-called western route and the eastern one. And they all somehow overlap here in Libya where, as you know, I discussed about this today in class with my students is uh, today unfortunately uh, a black hole and we will see what will happen in the next few months. And the, res the European response is very much is there, so there is a lot of European responses, which is, however, highly fragmented. They tend to cooperate, uh, but they are implementing this cooperation in different configurations, meaning unilateral with the French uh, uh, Balkan operation today, uh, minilateral, so different European countries taking money from the EU and operating with law enforcement agencies. And here I specifically refer to Italy, Spain, France, Germany, they are the leading countries in this type of minilateral cooperation. Of course, you also have the CSDP missions on the ground, uh, there are three. And this is what I got from my network. Uh, this is actually a colleague who did this for me, because I'm not so good with R. Uh, but basically, when you want to measure the network, you might see different actors operating in counter-terrorist fields at different levels. So in red, you have national, okay? Directly a government representative. Blue, you have sub-national, which might refer to law enforcement agencies. Or, I don't know, private, NG private NGOs, um, that are financed directly by the EU or even uh, member states. Supranational, uh, of course, the, mostly EU, so Europol, uh, Euro European External Action Service and the European Commission, who is the number one uh, financer of the uh, operations on the ground, and transnational as Eurogen before, then I didn't know existed. I didn't know what it was and I had to actually um, to understand what it was because it's not EU, it's a, a supranational organization of different law and um, gendarmerie forces. So those, force, those forces who can operate internally and externally as uh, defense, uh, defense actors. So the European Union is definitely one of the broker of this cooperation. Broker means, uh, refers to those actors who are able to um, connect the others uh, and have the information to connect the others. And they mostly do that through multilateral operations where a bunch of European countries and not only member states, but also ex uh, third state, uh, countries operate, but they also do this by uh, financing those operations that I was referring to before. Uh, so different operations where different actors, they're not necessarily state, but also NGOs, law enforcement agencies, take the money and they operate. They propose a project, a research, or whatever, something related to counter-terrorism on the ground, they take the money for the, from the EU and they operate locally. France is, of course, the, uh, the number one broker in the area. Traditionally, as you know, very jealous of his uh, unilateral capability to intervene uh, in the area, as, let's say, in the whole African continent. Uh, but in the last three or four years, France is also the one who's uh, incentivizing more and more European presence, collective European presence on the ground. Uh, not only, again, multilateral and multilateral, but also uh, taking money, uh, personnel, and support for his um, uh, unilateral operations, which is, you know, uh, something new, let's say. Uh, something interesting uh, to analyze. What's happening, however, is that this very good story of cooperation, let's say the uh, convergence towards uh, same practices to fight what it seems to be, what is perceived to be a common threat, a common enemy, so terrorism, which is in this case also linked to the problem of migration, so 
very functional European cooperation at different level, as we discussed, uh, that however is challenged by uh, opt-outs, let's say. Countries that um, do not, those same countries that are cooperating decided to not cooperate for other uh, for other initiatives that are actually going against what was agreed. One big example today is Italy, that launched in 2016 the first counter-terrorist operation slash uh, stopping irregular migration operation in Niger, that is being directly financed by the US. And they are operating in an area where the rest of the European operation it's, uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't exist, basically. Uh, and they were not, they actually decided to operate in this area, but the Italians open up, and not only they open up the new embassy, but they actually send troops on the ground. Following, this is the US interest, let's say, uh, the US, uh, US presence on the ground. So following the US, and many of the interviews that I conducted in Brussels, uh, many people told me that they were actually pretty um, mad with Italy because they didn't say anything, or very little. And the uh, EU uh, counter-terrorist coordinator, I showed you before, Gilles de Kekov, told me that he didn't even know about it. I was like, what do you think about the Italian deployment of forces in Niger? So like, what deployment? I was like, hmm, interesting to know that you didn't know anything. So apparently there are countries that are opting out, let's say, uh, from this cooperation. Another example is Germany. Uh, again, because of the money they are taking from the US. So it seems that the US is somehow, you know, uh, financing non-EU or non-European uh, cooperative uh, uh, measures, uh, sorry, uh, initiatives. So I think I'll conclude here. Uh, not an easy conclusion as we talked about terrorism in different forms and definitely in dif terrorism in different areas. Um, and how different areas, although very far away, very distant, might actually somehow influence each other. So not only external coming internally, but also us going outside and creating consequences. Um, I don't want to leave you with the impression that I don't think that terrorism a pro is a problem, isn't a problem. Of course it is, it is a very serious threat, but I think that more than other security threats uh, requires um, uh, more careful consideration uh, about the balance uh, to you be used between uh, art and soft power. So military interventions might be our way to go, but definitely it doesn't have to be the only one, especially if you uh, are afraid of the internal consequences of your military interventions abroad. So again, um, a careful consideration on the uh, impossibility to disconnect these two dimensions. Uh, and again, I think it's also a question of all political responsibility. So not only we as public discuss about terrorism as we, uh, or we as uh, informed citizens try to, you know, uh, to understand the problems, um, not only a responsibility of the news, of course, the news coverage that definitely uh, play a role here in the way you portray these events, but it's mostly, I think, a problem of uh, political responsibility and the responsibility of policymakers, not only party representatives, but also the um, representative of uh, institutions, and the way they talk and the way they uh, react to it, uh, I think it should be uh, taken into consideration. And we should also probably ask ourselves as citizens for more responsible um, governors and uh, policymakers. So I think I'll stop here, and I'm happy to receive all of your questions and doubts. I hope I was clear. If I wasn't and you're shy to ask a question today, please email me. It's silvia.damato3 at uh, unibo.it. Uh, and that's it. Thank you very much.
you want to pass this to me around. And is there any question, first of all? try to bury the eyes, okay? So, um, I wanted to ask you since the beginning, is there a European response to foreign fighters coming back, but they, who don't fight against, like, I, uh, when, who fight against ISIS, like with the Kurd, or like, I don't know, with the Syrian democratic forces and stuff like that, you know? So, I don't know, are they considered, because I, looked a video in which some people, Italians, went to Syria and then when they came back they, well, they were like changed by police. So I don't know what's the legal status of these people. Thank you. This is a actually a super relevant question, so thank you very much for asking this. Uh, how can we deal with the, what is uh, discussed as a same threat, so foreign fighters Per se, how can we deal with this when some of those foreign fighters are actually fighting for us? In the sense that many of the European foreign fighters um, are actually affiliated to Kurds militias that are, as you know, politically, economically, and militarily supported by European states. The problem is the uh, difficulty of definition. Uh, and the um, difficulty of finding the legal, um, uh, the legal instrument to persecute these people make that uh, those people, those foreign fighters that are fighting for the goods, so for us, have to pass to the same treatment that the foreign, bad foreign fighters fighting with ISIS are subjected to. Uh, you probably know about Orso, so this Florentine foreign fighter who left for uh, Syria to fight with the Kurds, and he basically became a hero, definitely in Florence, in the Rifredi, but not only. Um, but how can we deal with this? Because very recently in Rome, um, a group of, if I'm not mistaken, I might be wrong, so don't take, me, don't take my word for, for with this, uh, but uh, a group of 10 foreign, good foreign fighters has been arrested and is going to be prosecuted, so they have to pass to a trial, uh, because according to the prosecutor, uh, their um, anti-capitalist ideology is a threat. So they justify the decision to have these people on trial because of their ideological affiliation to some of the Kurd militias that are actually, uh, let's say, um, ideologically affiliating themselves to communist, anti-capitalist uh, ideology. I don't know, so the problem is that they, I mean, this is not just an Italian problem, but in Europe in general, they still have to develop the clear legal boundaries and the clear legal definitions to prosecute these people. Uh, so at the moment, as far as I know, they are basically treating everyone the same. Probably differences will come up in a trial, mostly for, uh, I think someone is also focusing on uh, international law, um, international conflict law, so the possibility to um, say it's the same logic that you have with the support of rebel in civil wars, so you uh, might justify, uh, let's say, a different uh, so solution for these people on the basis of international law and um, international humanitarian law. But this is a very good question. Unfortunately, I don't have a clear answer, as it seems Europe doesn't so far. <laughs> Thank you. So we saw uh, uh, just Netherlands between EU countries uh, um, have led a rehabilitation program differently from the uh, UK, uh, Germany, and France. So, first, maybe we classify rehabilitation programs as an internal soft power demonstration 
Second, why these countries uh, in, they have a great social problem with radicalization, especially for France in the Balears in Paris, uh, don't know to um, create a rehabilitation problem. Thank you. <laughs> That's a very good question. I think, first of all, it's a problem of um, interpretation of the threat, in the sense that, um, unfortunately, especially with the uh, uh, most recent attacks in France, there has been a um, um, hard uh, criminalization of the behavior in the sense they are treated as a challenge for national security. So not really as people um, um, subjected to injustices, social injustice, economic and social uh, exclusion and marginalization, but mostly as a security threat real military security threat, which means that you cannot apply the same uh, measures. And I think there is a debate going on, and I think it also uh, depends a lot on, um, very frankly, on resources. <laughs> I mean, to do rehabilitation programs, it's, it's really expensive. And for the amount of people that you have in Fish S, so the potential radicals, for all that amount of people, it would be most impossible to conduct rehabilitation programs. Uh, and, you see the, and you see this happening also in the prisons, in the way they're treated. There is no, um, I mean, a part of radicalization for many happens there because of the treatment they are subjected to. So I don't see this um, developing anytime soon, but I hope so. Um, I'd like to ask to what extent the difficulties in the communication between intelligences in different countries have an impact on the efficiency of the counter-terrorism counter operations and <clears throat> related to this what um, if the Europol has so far covered efficiently its role of uh, intelligence gatherer that you were talking about before. So when you uh, say the link between data gathering and counter-terrorism operation, you mean external counter-terrorism operation? Internal. Uh, well, there are... Um, there was an article that then disappeared, I tried to retrace that, uh, saying that Anis Amri was the guy who uh, responsible for the uh, Berlin attacks in the Christmas market, you might remember. Um, he was uh, in the Schengen information system as a potential threat, uh, but he was, uh, let's say, deleted by the German authorities uh, just a few months before the attack, as he was found dealing drugs. So the authorities said, okay, he's dealing drugs, he's just a criminal, he doesn't really have, and considering that uh, real Islamists, you know, have a pure interpretation of life, they will never use drugs, we deleted this. So they didn't share the information with the rest of the uh, Europeans. As, as you know, he had a transnational path before going to Germany. So he passed also uh, through Italy. And according to many, this was the reason why he was also able to, to move across Europe so easily. So there is probably a direct uh, impact on the way uh, countries share the uh, intel. Of course, sharing intel is probably the first quintessential priority of a national uh, nation state. So it's very difficult that states actually want to share the intel they gather, uh, because sharing intel might create opportunities, but might also limit your possibility uh, to act as an independent sovereign state. So. Uh, there is something that has been done. I think now European states are more willing to share because they see the clear consequences of not sharing. Um, but I think there we are still there is much to be done um, still. And Europol, um, it's not oh, Europol has some operative powers. 
and definitely has conducted some impressive investigative um, um, initiatives that led to the possibility to, to prevent many attacks. Although I didn't work much on Neuropol specifically, so I don't cannot. I know that it is a good actor, and they, on the basis of what they can actually do, because there is not, it's not that they can do everything because of the member states, uh, of course, uh, priorities and prerogatives on this. But on the basis of the power they have, this seems to be pretty, pretty good. But I cannot give you like a clear, super detailed answer on this. Uh, but if you want to check the report they publish, you will find some more interesting information. Definitely, Europol has also, it's interesting to see that it's more and more present externally. So they created liaison office with the European External Action Service on the ground. So you usually have one or two people from Europol supervising external CSDP mission, as it was the case for Mali. So they are, you know, kind of not focusing on only in internal security there, but they're going more and more externally. So they're my, uh, I mean, I think their role is evolving in a good way. Thank you. You showed us uh, the link between uh, uh, the attacks in Europe and the perception of refugees as threats, and particularly um, Hungary. And uh, I was thinking if there is a link between uh, th this perception of refugees as threat and an external response, especially for the eastern uh, countries, especially Hungary. In counter-terrorism, you mean? Or? Um, I don't know much about is, uh, Eastern Europe um, counter-terrorism, to be honest. Uh, what I can tell you is definitely perception matter in the uh, question of migration. I mean, Hungary is probably, the, with Poland, the two key examples on how very little uh, migrants might cause <laughs> a huge national different interpretation of it as a national security problem. Um, I don't see uh, a strong link with uh, terrorism in the sense that they, as far as I know, but I might be wrong, as far as I know they didn't really launch big counter-terrorism operation. They were mostly very focused on stopping migrations uh, on the basis of the idea that migrations might be uh, a channel for terrorists to enter the country. But what they did, again, as far as I know, was mostly uh, uh, to stop migrants, so not really to fight terrorists, um, which was also the case for many countries, European, Western European countries operating in Sahel and in the MENA region. Uh, so it's not only counter-terrorism, although it is sold as the core key uh, objective of the uh, operations, but what they are interested in is also uh, stopping irregular, mi irregular migrations, especially in the case of Niger, as we, uh, as we saw. But for instance, Germany um, started to be on board with the military operation only after 2015, and according to the people that I talked to, this was mostly because of the uh, migration crisis. So they jumped on the board of counter-terrorist operations to, you know, also to stop some migrants to come. So, yeah. Thank you. If I'm... Uh, no, no. Other question? <laughs> I wanted to ask, is there is any talk on a European level about a response, a common response and a common regulation as regards as foreign fighters coming back? Because it seems now a really compelling and compelling problem and I don't know if every country dealing with this separately is the best way to go, but like, is there any talk about that? 
Well, there is, thank you. There is. Uh, there has been in 2014, if I remember correctly, um, they released a regulation on um, strategic possibilities to respond, so suggestions to respond to it. So there is definitely the attempt, at least, to, uh, you know, to have all the uh, country, European countries, member states, on the same page. Uh, as mentioned, however, it seems not to be still a shared, completely shared framework. Uh, however, the uh, European Parliament very recently, in December, this last December 2018, uh, released um, a new report. Uh, and there are some, um, you know, suggestions on the way to go to really have a common framework. As far as I know, the Commission still now has the, uh, the report, and they probably have to do something with it. I don't know, the, the, I think the final stage will be somewhere in summer, this uh, next summer. Uh, I cannot tell you the details, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, there is definitely the, um, what I know is that there is definitely, uh, uh, um, oh my god, not incentive, but uh, the suggestion uh, and um, the pressure to go to, uh, towards non-traditional approaches to foreign fighters. So to also add some rehabilitation, as we mentioned, measures. Um, so try not to criminalize again that much uh, these people, but to try to have some legal instruments which will allow these people to um, re-enter the societies uh, that they flee in a peaceful way. Somehow to become, to get back to be European citizens. So it seems to be the, the ideal. Then we will see what happens in practice. Thank you. Questions? Something that I didn't tell you, but I think it's interesting to uh, to see, is the different um, instrumental views of many European countries towards the courts. For instance, we discussed about this, uh, meaning that, as you know, the courts are officially uh, financed and helped and supported by Europeans and the US, but at the same time, uh, UK and Germany have been found to finance Turkey and Turkish military operations against the two courts. So it's a report by um, The Guardian, I think, uh, where they reveal the uh, support that Germany and the UK is actually giving to Turkey to fight the courts, which we are paying to fight ISIS. So, I mean, complicated. And I always told this, courts is the next uh, problem that we will have. It's not that they are a problem per se, but you know. <laughs> Sorry. If there, are, if there are no other questions, so we can say thank you to, to Silvia D'Amato and see you uh, to our next conferences very soon. <laughs>